790 KFGO. It's 1240. This is It Takes Two with Amy and JJ. I'm Jack Sunday filling in for JJ here with Amy Eiler again. And on the line with us, first ladies man, Andrew Oak. You know him. You love him. We have holiday idea, gift ideas for you. But also we wanted to talk about the legacy of First Lady Carter as her life was celebrated yesterday. Andrew Oak, welcome back to KFGO Radio. No, always great to be here with you. Hello, Amy and Jack. Okay, so this clip that I'm going to play of Rosalind Carter's grandson, was this at the very beginning of the ceremony? No, you know, they, they all went in turn and chipped. Was the uh, was the, the 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 Carter's son who started off the family tributes yesterday, and it was you know the, the whole ceremony. We really have Mrs. Carter to thank for this. She was in on the planning of it, and I don't think she would have planned what each of the individuals was going to say. But you know these people understand their legacy, first ladies and presidents. And when I was doing the research for the C-SPAN White House Historical Association series. Back in 2013, the Ranger, uh, uh, Steve, um, I forget his last name, starts with a T. But anyway, shout out to Steve out there in Plains. But Steve showed me around. He said, the Carters know where their final resting place is going to be, and it's going to be here in Plains. He's like, I'm not going to tell you where it is because I'm not allowed to, but we know where they're going to end up. And now we all know they're ending up right there on the property. Mrs. Carter is is being uh, privately interned there with the family. As we speak, um, uh, the procession has made its way over from the uh, Maranatha Baptist Church in Plains, where I have attended um, services on Sunday mornings uh, in the past. And and uh, it's making its way probably a 15, 20-minute drive out to the Carter's um, property, the house that they built in the early 1960s. And that's where she and eventually President Carter are going to be laid to rest. Um, but they've known this for years. And, and Mrs. Carter, long before her dementia, had planned this ceremony because she knew it would be her legacy. And we all know that eventually we all will die. But they have a different almost responsibility to the public to plan their legacy and how they will be remembered um, before they're actually gone. So Mrs. Carter had a, 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 um, a very uh, upfront and, and active role in the planning of that service that was so fantastic yesterday. A family member would speak, then there was a, uh, um, a song, and the great-grandchildren would read a Bible passage, and then they'd go back and start over with a family member, then a song. Eventually, their uh, close friends, personal friends of the Carters, Garth Brooks and Tricia Yearwood sang John Lennon's Imagine, and I'm sure that was handpicked by Mrs. Carter as well. Goosebumps. But this in particular, as we have Andrew Oak, the First Lady's man on, was just a nice little nod to the First Ladies, every living First Lady in attendance there uh, yesterday. And again, a special thank you, Secretary Clinton, Mrs. Bush, Mrs. Obama, Mrs. Trump, and Dr. Biden. Thank you all for coming and acknowledging this remarkable sisterhood that you share with my grandmother. Thank you all for your leadership that you provided for our country and the world. Secretary Clinton and Dr. Biden, we also welcome your lovely husbands. <laughs> Just a nice little, um, nice little nod to that. All got a that got a a clap, of course, from the crowd. Uh, but oh that, yeah, I, did, I love that. Did an, yeah, Jason did an incredible job. Um, and, and and I tell you, this is you know the Carters are an administration, a president and first lady, a family, a town there in Plains where we really know a lot about them remarkably accessible people over the years during their presidency and especially in their extremely active and prolific and well-accomplished post-White House life. We, we had access to these people. If you went to Plains, I mean, I went to Plains. I celebrated Mr. Mrs. Carter's birthday with her last year, gave her a set of my books. She said, thank you. She took my hand very sweetly. And, and I was there as she was lighting up a new statue in in the uh, 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 Rosalind Carter Childhood Garden, right next to the house where she grew up in, and my friend and 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 uh, Mrs. Carter's niece, uh, Leanne Smith, lives in the house to this day. It's a family house; they've kept it in the family, and that's where the statue is, and and the the the, um, the garden there, the, the childhood garden for Mrs. Carter. And, but but even with all of that access and them being people of the people and among the people and walking around Atlanta and really not having a huge security detail and, and, and pretty much living their lives as an open book, attending 
church services every Sunday there at the Maranatha Baptist Church, and even teaching Bible study uh, long into their adult life, into their 80s and even early 90s. But we still found out more, and, and, and Chip, their son, Amy, their daughter, and Jason, their, 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 uh, their grandson, was able to, to make Mrs. Carter even more of a real person by sharing family stories. What were the stories that you were surprised or didn't know about? Because there's not a lot that you don't know about these first ladies. I mean, as you yeah. said, you've met them, you've been to their hometowns, you've you've seen letters they've written, you've you've learned about their lives and and their lives before being the first lady, during and after. What were the stories that you were l- surprised about? Like, oh, the first ladies' man didn't even know that story. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I I knew that there had been a. Uh, 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 some uh, addiction uh, issues in, in Chip's life and Chip's family, but he thanked his mother. He openly thanked his mother for, for helping him get through that, and that made Mrs. Carter very real. I mean, because, you know, they, Mrs. Carter stood up for mental health, and she stood up for women's rights, and she stood up for unemployment, and she stood up for uh, 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 equal rights and, and, and all the things that she did. But But, you know, a mother helping her son through addiction and through that process is very, very personal. And then, you know, the story is getting back to Jason. He, he, he said that they took a family trip, and he goes, we flew Delta. And, of course, they flew Delta because that's the hub out of uh, Atlanta. But you don't picture the Carters just rolling through the Atlanta airport, especially the whole family, and hopping on a regular Delta commercial flight. But apparently they did, and he said we took up the whole back of the plane. And as soon as we got up in the air, he said his grandmother, Mrs. Carter, started pulling out loaves of bread and making everyone pimento cheese sandwiches oh, and there was so much that she brought with her that she started handing them out on the plane to everyone he said i couldn't imagine what some random person a member of the just regular public flying a delta flight to wherever thought when first lady rosalind carter handed them a pimento sandwich in the middle of the flight I, it was just fantastic and all of her her hiking accomplishments she'd been to mount fuji mount everest i mean like I just don't know where she found the time to do this. It's just a, just an incredible, incredible woman. You, you know, uh, was her was her name pronounced Rosalind or Rosalind? For oh my, my gosh, well, am, I feel like I go back and forth on that too. What? Thank you for saying that. It's it's, it's Rose. It's Rosalind. Oh, she, Rosalind. She was named after, and that's her middle name. Her name is Eleanor Rosalind Smith Carter. Oh. Uh, she was named after her uh, grandmother, whose name was Rosa. And then they just tacked a Lynn on the end. It's funny. I was just reading earlier today that her first name is Eleanor, but she goes by Rosalind. And Eleanor Roosevelt's middle name is Eleanor, or, or, um, uh, and she goes by her middle name, Eleanor, not her, her first name, Anne. So both women who, who really changed the face of, of the role of first lady and did so much in their post-White House life, Eleanor Roosevelt and Rosalind Carter, both go by their middle names, but – but uh, 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 hmm. just just interesting little trivia and tidbits, and since we bring up the name, I uh, Jimmy Carter was the first American president born in a hospital. By the way, in case you want to talk that over a bear sometime, but I also ran into an article yesterday saying that Rosalind Carter was the best first lady in modern history, and then it goes on to list why, and and, and that uh, and there have been. Uh, you know, Bess Truman and Jackie Kennedy and Pat Nixon, Hillary Clinton, Barbara Bush, who were successful. But this particular article points out that she was the best first lady in modern history. And two-part question here. Uh, do you agree with that? And, and two, where did the uh, nickname the Steel Magnolia come from? Sure. Well, as far as the best, I mean, you know, people ask me all the time who my favorite is, and it's nearly impossible to say. She is definitely one of the most accomplished. She changed the face of the role. Uh, she she established an office there, and many many first ladies, uh, going back to the to the beginning of the 20th century, and the first first lady of the 20th century. Edith Roosevelt was the first first lady to have an office in the White House and a staff and things like that. But Mrs. Carter was the one who put that office in the in the in the East Wing there and had that big staff and, and brought it in and really started more of an accountability and, and more of an advisory role to her husband going to cabinet meetings and, and, and uh, staff meetings there in the White House. And she openly said, she said, if I'm going to help Jimmy, 
I need to know what these issues are, and I need to be in on these meetings. And she went and met with criticism on it. So, you know, the, the thing with the Carters is their, her, her post-White House life, her post-White House career is nearly unparalleled. You have to go with the, uh, the Eleanor Roosevelt and the Barbara Bushes and put them in that category. So, you know, is, is she the best? That, that, you know, one of the best, certainly, and in a ma- very, very small uh, category of, of first ladies who have gone on, human beings, even, even all the work that she's done. But she was, not, she was more than a rubber stamp. You know, she wasn't she she went and and, you know, just by way of example, she found out that monarch butterflies were having trouble migrating from Mexico to Canada back and forth because their habitats and their gardens were disappearing. So she made a butterfly garden there in Plains, Georgia, and a butterfly trail, then took that all the way across Georgia, then took it down to Mexico, then took it up to Canada. And that's part of what I was doing in Plains last year. We were releasing monarch butterflies at her new statue in the new Rosalind uh, Carter childhood garden. But then she didn't even stop there. She called Michelle Obama back when Michelle Obama was first lady in the White House and said, as part of this effort, she would like to see a butterfly garden at the White House in Washington, D.C. And Mrs. Obama obliged and put in a butterfly garden. I mean, it just it was endless, and it was just beginning, middle, and end of any part. The guinea worm epidemic in, in uh, Africa and the mental health, uh, you know, pulling the stigma away from uh, uh, mental health and suicide and, and also turning it, the attention to caregivers and just talking about things that people were not talking about. And that's where some of these first ladies, and especially Mrs. Carter, stand out. They bring issues that are not popular. They're not well known. They're uh, issues that have been in the in the shadows and swept under carpets. Betty Ford would be another, uh, you know, that we could talk about for uh, um, you know cancer and addiction, things that just were not talked about. Breast cancer, especially a specific cancer. So you know, Mrs. Carter is one of those first ladies that did extraordinary work uh, for things that that weren't popular always. There was no 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 issue too big or too small or too important or too seemingly unimportant for her to to wrap her mind around i i I read also that i don't know if she was fluent in other languages but in her trips through central and south america and mexico she was able to communicate very effectively with the people that she met was she fluent in other languages she was definitely fluent in spanish and she took that upon herself because she was going to get involved in these issues in Central and South America. And that just shows you the lengths that this woman would go to to educate herself, wrap her mind around a topic uh, with, the, with the peace treaties in the Middle East. You know, she's talking to leaders in, in and, bringing, and helping President Carter bring leaders to the table in Israel and Egypt. And I mean, you know, we can, we can look at the headlines today and see what the horrible things are going uh, on. But, but she was part of, in, in 2008, I think it was, she, she was part of a, an Oslo peace summit. I mean, the, the work just kept going on, and she studied the regions, she studied the languages, she studied the issues, so she could walk into a room very confidently and be taken seriously. Again, not just a rubber stamp, not just a figurehead. She did what she believed in and believed in what she did. Andrew Oak is with us, the First Ladies Man. First lady, the FirstLadiesMan.com is where you can find him as well. Um, let's go back to your question, Jack, about Steel Ma- that, yeah. that nickname, that Steel Magnolia. Oh, for sure. Well, I, she she was she was a very very lovely, polite, appropriate, wonderful, charming lady, but she did not suffer fools and she did not put up with nonsense. And that's a trait that so many of these first ladies have. You know, they're 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 really the the the, the greater women behind these great men. Again, you can bring Barbara Bush up in this, and they always talk about how Barbara Bush was really running the show. Uh, of the family, you know, not 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 you know running the, the the Bush White House by any imagination, but certainly again not suffering any fools, and that's why Mrs. Carter would not back down. She was very strong. She was very strong-willed. She voiced her opinion, and but she did it in this sweet, pretty, wonderful way. And it was it's 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 an effect it's it's an effective technique, you know. I mean, it's you know throw you know 
look high and throw low kind of thing. You know, they're they're so enamored with with your sweetness and your wonderful tone and nature and politeness that they don't realize what you're really doing is you're 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 ramming these issues through that you believe in and you're not taking no for an answer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she she'd be one of those who probably say, "Well, bless your heart." <laughs> oh, one hundred percent, one hundred. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Jack. When when I was with her on her birthday last year, I I I, I waited my turn, and President Carter was there, and we haven't even gotten to President Carter showing up to say, I mean, it's just the sweetest daggone thing you've ever seen in your life. You know, he had a new suit made for these ceremonies. He didn't feel like his suit was right, and he had he had a new suit made because he was going to be out in public, 99 years old, 10 years, uh, 10 years, 10, 10 months, rather, in, in hospice care. But it, it's interesting, and while I'm on the subject, and, and we'll, get, we'll get back to what I was going to say here, it, but, but Jimmy Carter, President Carter, was most distressed when he found out he was going into hospice care and knew that his wife had dementia. And he thought and told friends and family and doctors, I've been told this by family members, that he was extremely concerned that he was going to die before his wife. And he thought that with her dementia, he need, she needed him around to make sure that she could pass on to this next stage and, and pass on and, and die peacefully. He needed to be there to shepherd her through that process. And that's what he did. He hung on. You know, it's funny. Another family member said that when President Carter was put in hospice, she asked personally the doctor, what does this mean? And he said, well, for a normal person, I'd say days, weeks, you know, maybe a month at best. And he said, but this is Jimmy Carter we're talking about. We have no idea how long he'll go. And he's gone 10 months, and he really held on to make sure that his wife, with her condition of dementia, could, could die peacefully with him there. And when she did die, he asked all of the family to leave so he could have a few moments in the room by himself with his wife. It's just such a beautiful, as you call it, a love story on your website. Will you stay with us? Because we didn't get the story of you meeting um, Mrs. Carter last year. We want to get that. Also, if you go to firstladiesman.com, you can see a picture of that. A nice little tribute to the First Lady, Mrs. Carter, right there at firstladiesman.com. We want to talk about your books. Will you stick with us for a little bit longer? Absolutely, okay. Amy, always. Okay. Bless your heart, sweetheart. <laughs> Very cool. We're talking to Andrew Oak. He is the First Ladies Man. You can find him at firstladiesman.com. We have been talking about the legacy of Mrs. Carter, the celebration of her life. And um, Andrew Oak is the expert on all things First Ladies. I'm sure you've been pulled three million different directions to talk about uh, Mrs. Carter in the last week or so, Andrew. It's been a, it's been a busy uh, it's been a busy couple of weeks or a busy week and a half or whatever. I've kind of lost track as well with the holiday travel in between. But I'll tell you, I, I've had the good fortune of uh, uh, an honor, really. I mean, be, being being the first ladies man and having the access to the first ladies and their collections and their history and their letters and diaries, and museums and all the different historic sites and stuff is is a privilege uh, and it's one that I don't take lightly. But being able to memorialize these great women, uh, I've had the, 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 the privilege and honor of memorializing uh, um, Nancy Reagan, Barbara Bush, and, and now Rosalind Carter. And again, as we were saying before the break, you will be hard-pressed to find anyone who has done as much with their life, first lady or not, uh, than, than Rosalind Carter, just a, a remarkably accomplished woman in so many different arenas for so many different causes. And, you know, one of the, one of the quotes that, that is, uh, is associated with her is just, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but it's, you know, show people you care about them and you will make the world a better place. And she really was trying to make the world a better place, like we've talked about, from saving monarch butterflies to eradicating guinea worm disease in Africa and everything in between. No cause, no issue too small, too large, too important, or, or too seemingly insignificant for, for Mrs. Carter. You, you know, uh, Lady Bird Johnson, I, I remember she she took an active role in, in certain aspects of nature, her shrubs, trees, and bushes planting. I, I remember her, you know, urging the, the freeways and such to plant more shrubs, trees, and bushes. But yeah. here's... Here's Rosalind Carter out saving uh, monarch butterflies. Well, and a lot of the, you know, the, these these women, and you can go back, well, you know, 
part of my studies and my research and thesis is to show you very, very not without. It's not a stretch to say that we would not be America if if George Washington had married anyone other than Martha Dandridge Custis, the widow Martha Custis. Uh, you know that's how significant these women have been to the presidency, to America, to the modern world. But you move forward uh, and looking at the stuff, you 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 can look all around. And I've done this. I've taken people on tours of Washington D.C. just here in our nation's capital and say that's because of First Lady. This that's because I mean the Washington Monument. You know, it's what you think of when you think of Washington. You see it every time you fly into the into the city. Uh, you can't go nearly anywhere in the city without looking up and, and seeing it. That would not have been completed uh, after the Civil War had it not been for First Lady Lucy Hayes. And most people couldn't even name Rutherford B. Hayes's wife if they could name Rutherford B. Hayes. You know, so these women have had an impact on on us, our lives, the modern world from the very beginning. And again, you'd be hard pressed to find someone who worked as hard to make the world a better place than Rosalind Carter. Rosalind Carter, Jimmy Carter, married for was it seventy-seven years? Is seventy-seven that, years, as of this past uh, July, I believe. Is that the longest running marriage in in sort of presidential history? It is one hundred percent. So, so the Bushes are second, and this is funny. You know, they 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 came so within such close proximity of of each other in the White House, in sort of, you know, the same decade, the same era, uh, Bush 41 and, and uh, President and Mrs. Carter. Um, but, but they are the first and, and second longest presidential marriages in history. Um, um, and President Carter is now at 99 years the longest living president. Mrs. Carter is the second longest living first lady at 96. The longest living first lady at 97 was Bess Truman. Um, and then it goes to uh, uh, Mrs. Carter, uh, tied with at 94, I believe, with Lady Bird Johnson, and then Barbara Bush at 92. But but a, a good handful of first ladies lived into their 90s, and, and Mrs. Carter is the second longest living first lady in history. Did they have – their children were a little bit older when – Jimmy Carter was elected. Is that right? Did they have kids yeah, in well, the White House? I I don't three, recall. Sure, sure. I, I the, the three of the, the the three brothers are older, and then Amy came along. So so when the Carters were in the White House, I'm old enough to remember. I I think I'm a little older than Amy Carter, but she was a young kid going to school, and I remember she took violin lessons with the with the very famous. I don't know if they were associated with the National Symphony in Washington, D.C., but certainly a nationally known um, advanced uh, violin program called the Suzuki Violin Program. And Amy Carter was in the Suzuki Violin Program when I was a kid, and I knew this because the musical director at my church in Kensington, Maryland, John Horman, had a daughter also named Amy who was the same age as Amy Carter, and they were in the Suzuki Violin Program <laughs> together in Washington, D.C. Oh and goodness. Amy Carter... And President and First Lady Carter came to my church in the mid-'70s to give a, a concert, uh, uh, some sort of violin concerto or something of the nature. And and everyone was just like, you know, just going bananas for Enamored, it. Enamored, I mean, yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, we love, we, love, we love young families in the White House, you know, the, the, the Bush daughters, the Obama daughters. Uh, going back to the Johnsons and the Nixons, you know, there, there's there, the, the Fords had a had a big and active family that were a little bit older, I think, when they were when they were in the White House. But yeah, young kids are always very popular, and young moms and, and younger first ladies, and Mrs. Carter certainly falls into that. Now, the the brothers, the three brothers, were very very instrumental in the campaign for the White House, as was Mrs. Carter. This is just one other thing that she took on. And 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 took control and command over very successfully. She led the Peanut Brigade, and the Peanut Brigade was headquartered out of a little train station depot right on Main Street in Plains, Georgia. I've been there, no surprise. Stood in in the train depot and watched where President or or then Governor Jimmy Carter accepted the Democratic nomination with friends and family of, and fans and and supporters all there in planes around this train station. But Jimmy Carter and his fi his entire family, and that would be the, the sons and Mrs. Carter, led the peanut brigade out of that train depot and went all across the country, literally knocking on doors, grassroots efforts to say, hey, 
our governor, Jimmy Carter, is running for president, and this is why you need to know him, and this is why you need to vote for him. And it won. It won him the presidency in the same way they had done to win him the governorship because no one knew where Plains was. You know, wow. Plains is a town, I think, yeah. today of like 600. And Jim, it, Mrs. Carter growing up, they didn't have two nickels to rub together. And uh, uh, President Carter was part of a family peanut farm that I guess did okay. Um, you know, but these two families are intertwined from the very beginning from being such a tiny little town. Mrs. Mrs. Carter, President Carter's mother, who was known as Miss Lillian, she was a nurse there in Plains, and she actually helped deliver Rosalind Smith. And so Jimmy Carter met his future wife when he was like, you know, three three years old, and she was a couple months old. And later on, uh, Rosalind Smith would be friends with Jimmy Carter's sisters. And Miss Lillian, President Carter's mother, was also the nurse, the hospice nurse, that cared for uh, Rosalind's father when he died, uh, when, when Rosalind was just 14 years old. So these families have been intertwined uh, from the very, very beginning, and it, it, it's difficult to separate either of them. And they're just a, an extremely powerful and productive and prolific couple that have, that have lasted the, the test of time together right up until the very end. It's just, it's just one of the sweetest and, and most remarkable stories in American history. Someone else texted in at 35270 and said, Lady Bird Johnson made it so they couldn't put advertisement signs in national parks. Thank you, Lady Bird Johnson. Um, yeah, is that true? Lady Bird, her, yeah, her, her, her thing was the beautification of America. Oh, yeah. And that, that so, so, so a lot of these little, you know, roadside parks and roadside rest areas and gardens and things like that are all because of Lady Bird Johnson because America is such a big, broad, vast country uh, you know i mean we've got states that are as big as some other people's countries and people will bounce around in europe on trains you know and go from country to country to country we go from state to state to state just a, a massive massive land map and so many things to see and we love our cars and we love our highways and we love to drive you know people take driving vacations still where they drive across america and when you're driving down the road and you see a pretty stretch of roadway with wild flowers and little parks and rest stops and and it's not cluttered with massive billboards and advertising and nonsense. You've got Lady Bird Johnson to thank for that. Uh, Andrew Oak, firstladiesman.com is where you can find all of his work. But even better, you can find his books. Uh, give us a brief overview. I, I think these are just the world's best gift for someone who has absolutely everything, which is most of us. And so if you have someone that's interested in history, and most notably maybe the First Ladies, um, these are wonderful gifts this holiday season. So let's talk a little bit about your books. And um, wow, you're going to have to, how are you going to keep getting these First Ladies? You're going to have to do another book someday, Andrew. Well, yeah, sure, sure. And it's funny, I just, before the interview, I just got back, I shipped uh, three sets of signed books off today that are going to be uh, one is a one is a Hanukkah present for a woman's mother up in Boston. One's going locally here in D.C. and another out to Colorado, where a, a friend is is buying a set for his uh, for his wife, who I went to college with. It's just been a remarkable journey and a lot of fun on so many different levels. But uh, we've got volume. It's, it's unusual for their time on the road with America's first ladies, and it's everything that I learned and more uh, while producing the television series. First Lady's Influence and Image for C-SPAN and the White House Historical Association. And I was the traveling producer that went to all the historical sites, museums, libraries, train stations, like I mentioned, in Georgia, and any place that could be related to a First Lady. And here's what I found, and here's what made me the First Lady's man, is that you don't really have to have an overt or obvious or, or recognizable interest in history. First ladies have been around since before our country. So if it happened in the world and in our country, you can relate a first lady to it from the time of the 1700s all the way up through modern times. And people watching this coverage of Rosalind Carter and, and people that come to my speeches or read my books, they're interested in it, and they didn't even know that they were interested in it. And most people think, well, oh, these will be for, like, little old lady history groups. Well, sure, little old lady history groups love me and love the first ladies' man and love – the first ladies themselves and the books and things like that, but also so do their husbands and so do their children and so do their grandchildren. I mean, these really are stories for all audiences and all ages and all interest levels because it relates to America and the modern world. 
We can relate just like we were talking about driving across country with Lady Bird Johnson or mental health and, and, and helping remove the stigma of, of suicide and working with caregivers with Rosalind Carter and different museums and different everything along the way. So volume one is Martha Washington through Ida McKinley. It's the 1700s through 1800s. And volume two starts off with the first first lady of the 20th century, Edith Roosevelt, and goes all the way up to the election of Trump. So volume two goes through the election of Trump, and we knew that Melania Trump would be our next first lady. And now I'm just kind of waiting for the next chunk of presidential museums and libraries and collections and papers to be accessible and open up. The you know COVID kind of pump, put the brakes on a, on a lot of stuff for us for a while there, but the Obama Museum has not opened in Chicago yet. We don't even know where the Trump Museum is going to be. And now we've got Dr. Jill Biden. So, you know, there's a lot of experiences. I've become closer with the Carter family since I wrote volume two. And there's a lot of things that I've gone back to a lot of the first ladies in volume one that I can expand these chapters. So the plan is to currently work to expand the chapters that I can while waiting for these museums to open and get there and view the collections and get that backstage pass that I had to all the other libraries and then put a book together and do a second edition, which would bring us as current as possible for if, if Jill Biden is, is in there for another four years or whoever is, is next, you know, we can include them as well. And, you know, if you go to firstladiesman.com, go to the store tab, you can find that you can get a Hardcover set, volume one and two, and uh, a First Lady's Man Seal t-shirt. So you can talk yeah. about these books, too. I love that. Get the whole trifecta for the holidays. You can you can order it all there. You can order just volume one or volume two or both of them or a t-shirt, whatever you need there at the store. It's a, it's a, it's a fun gift to someone. And it opens up such a great conversation piece with that person who you give it to. You're going to want to get a set for yourself, too, so you can talk about it. Andrew Oak, First Ladies Man here on KFGO. Thanks again so much for all of your time today. Happy holidays to you both and to JJ, wherever he's vacationing, and everyone listening. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I look forward to coming back soon. S- sounds good. Thanks, Andrew.